if they were drinking their own spiked Kool-Aid when they came up with Plan B, then I believe they were imbibing some of that milk of the poppy when Plan C was created. They threw everything but the kitchen sink at Trump. And the more corrupt they were, the louder they screamed. America hadn't seen Democrats this mad at a Republican president since Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. When he was elected, there was an effort to sue three states for the voting machines and nullify the election. There was a, a, a sustained effort to give the steel dossier to the electors and to, to persuade the right, electors right. not to vote according to their constitutional mandates. Then there was almost immediately 60 representatives that voted for impeachment the week he was inaugurated. Then there was an effort to sue on the emoluments clause of the Constitution to remove it. Finally, there was Rob Rosenstein and Andrew McKay meeting to see if they could pull cabinet members to remove him. But thank goodness Admiral Rogers was still on the job. Admiral Rogers visited Trump Tower on November 17th of 2016 without informing the Obama administration. He visits Trump in Trump Tower. He probably goes up there and says, brother, they're spying on you, like right now. And what happens the very next day? Donald Trump evacuates Trump Tower and goes to Bedminster, New Jersey. All of a sudden, people start resigning from the federal government after that. You know who also resigns? Bob Hannigan. Bob Hannigan is the head of the uh, GCHQ, which is the British NSA. He says, oh, I'm leaving for family reasons. Family reasons, your reason, you're leaving because Donald Trump got elected. Obama's final days in office were dedicated to trying to stop the now president-elect Trump. Lisa Page had texted Peter Strzok back on September 2nd of 2016. Oh, pumpkin, the POTUS wants to know everything we're doing. The Obama team listened in on a meeting in Trump Tower between the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates and senior level Trump officials on December 15th of 2016. Susan Rice did the unmasking. The president, his associates, their names could have been bandied about by foreign officials. They could have been picked up in incidental collections. Yes, they could have. Correct? That is possible. Indeed. And you could have asked for those names of American number one, American number two, however it's identified, to be unmasked so you would know how significant it was. That's exactly right. A shocking revelation to tell you about right now, information regarding the unmasking of Trump campaign members by former Obama National Security Advisor Susan Rice is stored at the Obama Library and will be under lock and key for five years. On December 29th of 2016, President Obama imposed sanctions on Russia for election interference, which triggered Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak to call Trump's soon-to-be national security advisor, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. The Obama team spied on that call too, and then they committed a felony-level leak of that information to the press. Under Obama's leadership, Team Hillary had gathered tons of information on the Trump team, and they were going to keep on renewing that Carter Page FISA warrant through June of 2017. With mere days left in the Obama administration, they rushed to find a way to disseminate the information that they had already collected to as many people as possible. They also wanted a mechanism by which the information that would be collected in the future could also be spread around, maximizing the number of people that had access to the information on the Trump team associates would make it much easier for people to leak without getting caught. And that's why on January 3rd of 2017, in the twilight of the Obama administration, James Clapper and Loretta Lynch were scurrying around making last minute changes to section 2.3 of executive order 12333. Previously, the NSA controlled raw data, but now any of the other 16 intelligence agencies could access raw data much easier and without the privacy protections that had previously been required. It's increased 16-fold the number of people that would have access to the communications. And what that does is it almost creates a shadow government. You have all these people that are not agreeing with the president, President Trump's position, so it just festers more do, leaks. Do you agree uh, you know, with If they me? had a justification for this, wonderful. Why didn't they do it eight years ago, four years ago, three years ago? Yeah. They wait till 17 days left. President Obama, James Clapper, Loretta Lynch should be held accountable for this. 
And for anyone that wanted to make the case that Section 2.3 was changed solely for national security reasons, Evelyn Farkas, Obama's own Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, put that myth to bed when she explained why there had been so many leaks. I was urging my former colleagues and, frankly speaking, the people on the Hill, get as much information as you can, get as much intelligence as you can before President Obama leaves the administration. The Trump folks, if they found out how we knew what we knew about their, the staff, the Trump staff dealing with Russians, that they would try to compromise those sources and methods. That's why you have the leaking. Exactly. People are worried. Brennan and Clapper produced a series of reports designed to push the Russian narrative. The joint statement from the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which was released on October 7th of 2016, Grizzly Step on December 29th of 2016, and the Intelligence Community Assessment on Russian Election Interference, or ICA, on January 6th of 2017. On March 5th of 2018, Admiral Rogers sent a classified letter to House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes, clarifying that in late December of 2016, a two-page summary of the Steele dossier was added as an appendix to the ICA draft, and that his consideration of the appendix was part of the overall ICA review and approval process. This claim was further cemented by Horowitz in the IG report when he noted that James Comey and Andrew McCabe pushed for the dossier information to be included in the ICA, which it was. Do you know if the Bureau ever relied on the Steele dossier as, any, as part of any court filings, applications, petitions, pleadings? I have no awareness. Did the CIA rely on it? No. Why not? Because we, we didn't. We, it wasn't part of the corpus of intelligence uh, information that we had. It was not in any way used as a basis for the intelligence community assessment that was done. Uh, it, was, it was not. The decision to include dossier information in the ICA lent credibility to the dossier and helped promote unfounded fears of Russian collusion. Clapper blamed Obama for the mess. If it weren't for President Obama, we might not have done the intelligence community assessment that we did that set off a whole sequence of events which are still unfolding today, notably Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. President Obama uh, is responsible for that, and it was he who tasked us to do that intelligence community assessment uh, in the first place. It's worth noting that Admiral Rogers publicly dissented from the findings of the ICA and only gave the report a moderate confidence level rating. On January 5th of 2017, intelligence community chiefs briefed President Obama on the ICA. Following the briefing, Obama held a meeting with Joe Biden, Susan Rice, Sally Yates, and James Comey, where they discussed the dossier. This meeting was memorialized in a suspicious sounding email Susan Rice sent herself on inauguration day. The email mentioned multiple times that President Obama wanted to proceed, quote, by the book, unquote, because that's how innocent people talk. And Obama wanted to know if there was any reason they could not share information fully as it related to Russia with the Trump transition team. Rice seemingly wrote this email to protect herself in the event someone asked her why she violated long-standing civic norms by concealing facts relating to national security and Russia from General Flynn, who was her counterpart in the incoming administration. This email gave her the ability to say that President Obama ordered it. I must say, I, I want to thank Susan Rice for being so stupid uh, and so arrogant to write that email on January 20th because that's exhibit A for that Barack Obama knew all about this from start to finish and was more than happy to have the civil rights of massive numbers of Americans violated so he could get Donald Trump. In an interview he gave to CNN, Comey declared that Clapper and Brennan told him to brief President-elect Trump only on the perverted stuff in the dossier. Comey did exactly that on January 6th of 2017. According to the IG report, immediately following the meeting, Comey was given a secure FBI laptop in the car so he could type his version 
of what President-elect Trump had said while the vehicle moved. Comey then had a video conference with Andy McCabe, Comey's chief of staff James Rubicki, and general counsel James Baker, along with other top Crossfire Hurricane officials, because the group had decided before Comey's meeting with President-elect Trump that Comey use it as an opportunity to spy on him. Members of the media had had the dossier for a while and wanted to report on it, but they hadn't because it was total garbage and they didn't want to embarrass themselves by publishing bat boy level smut. Comey knew this and even confessed to it in one of his memos. Media like CNN had them and were looking for a news hook. I said that it was inflammatory stuff that they would get killed for reporting straight up from source reports. The House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence's report on Russian active measures revealed that Clapper admitted that he confirmed the existence of the dossier to the media. And one can also infer from the report that it was Clapper that told CNN's Jake Tapper about President-elect Trump being briefed on the dossier. General Clapper, have you ever leaked information classified or unclassified to a member of the press? Mm, uh, not wittingly or knowingly, as I said in my statement. When the media heard from Clapper that the dossier was so important that high-level government officials were being briefed on it, they took it as a green light to publish dossier-related stories. Four days after President-elect Trump was briefed by Comey on parts of the dossier, which was January 10th of 2017, CNN published an article titled, Intel Chiefs Presented Trump with Claims of Russian Efforts to Compromise Him. And they read part of that article word for word on the air. Classified documents on Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election presented last week to President Obama and to President-elect Trump included allegations that Russian operatives claimed to have compromising personal and financial information about Mr. Trump. These were based on memos compiled by a former British intelligence operative whose past work U.S. intelligence officials consider credible. The FBI is now investigating the credibility and accuracy of the allegations. BuzzFeed published the dossier in full on the same day. This one-two punch skyrocketed the phony Russian collusion narrative into the American mainstream. Christopher Steele was not the originating source of any of the factual information in his reporting. Steele relied on a primary subsource for his information who used his or her network of subsources to gather information that was then passed to Steele. According to the IG report, in January of 2017, right after the first Carter Page FISA warrant renewal, Steele's primary subsource told the FBI that the dossier was nothing but a bunch of lies. Look, man, I saw this dossier for the first time when it came out in the media, just like everybody else did, okay? The stuff that Steele wrote is not even what I said. Steele exaggerated and lied all over the place. The PP tape, that was just rumor and speculation. And the guy that told me about Carter Page meeting with Igor Sechin never said that Sechin offered Carter Page a $12 billion bribe. Come on, man. $12 billion? That didn't sound funny to you? Aren't you supposed to be the head of intelligence or something? Carter Page's role in the supposed $12 billion Rosneft bribe was the main dossier claim against him, and the FBI had proof that it was utter nonsense in January of 2017. Instead of canceling the Carter Page FISA warrant because the dossier played a central and essential role in obtaining the FISA warrant, the FBI told the FISA court that they found the primary subsource to be credible. But what the FBI didn't say was that the primary subsource was credible and truthful when he or she said that the dossier was hot garbage. In the second and third renewals, the last two applications, they told the court that they had interviewed <laughs> Steele's primary subsource, who, upon whom Steele relied in writing the reporting, and that they found the primary subsource to be credible. Um, they did not tell the court or the department lawyers any of the information which would have allowed them to know that if you found the primary subsource credible, you couldn't have also found the Steele reporting credible. Did they mislead the court? That was misleading to the court. Then in January 2017, the whole foundation for surveilling Carter Page collapses, exculpatory information is ignored, 
They lie to the court about what the interview was all about. If you don't have a legal foundation to surveil somebody and you keep doing it, is that bad? Absolutely. Is that spying? Um, it's it's not it's illegal surveillance. It's not court authorized. Whatever surveillance illegal advisor. surveillance means, they did it. I hope this chapter in American history is never repeated. And finally, if you report that this 434 page report says lawful investigation with a few irregularities, you're doing a great disservice to the American people. In a subsequent FBI interview, the primary subsource said that he slash she made it clear to Steele that he slash she had no proof to support statements from his slash her subsources and that it was just talk. The subsources information came from word of mouth and hearsay and conversations that they'd had with friends over beers and that the PP tape information was just a bunch of jokes. But I don't know whether the current president of the United States with, with prostitutes peeing on each other in Moscow in 2013. It's possible, but I don't know. If that wasn't bad enough, FBI lawyer Kevin Kleinsmith added his contribution to the mix. Strzok and Page weren't the only FBI employees that weren't smart enough to know not to use their work devices to brag about their wrongdoings. In a series of instant messages, Kleinsmith said things like, I'm so stressed about what I could have done differently. Pence is stupid. My bleep bleep name is all over the legal documents investigating his staff. So who knows if that breaks to him, what he's going to do. Viva la resistance. I mean, I really never liked the Republic anyway. And as I have initiated the destruction of the Republic, would you be so kind as to have a coffee with me this afternoon? Mr. Kleinsmith, for example, I reported to him the death threats that I was getting based on these false stories in April 2017. And not only did he do nothing, but then they had more uh, leaks and more subsequent terror threats, which was pushed by the yeah. deep state in their Democrat colleagues. Kleinsmith's crimes culminated with the doctoring of an email from the CIA to the FBI that originally stated that Carter Page was a CIA asset. He changed it to say that Carter Page was not working as a CIA asset. Carter Page, a Naval Academy graduate, had achieved the rank of lieutenant in the Navy and had worked in military intelligence. He had been working with the CIA from 2008 to 2013, helping his country catch Russian spies. And the contacts that he made with Russians at the behest of the CIA were first made into false allegations in the Steele dossier and later knowingly used against him by the FBI to obtain a FISA warrant because the FBI learned back on or about January 17th of 2016 that Carter Page was a CIA asset. Carter Page was both a CIA asset and had assisted the FBI to help put Russian spy Evgeny Buryakov behind bars. If you're telling the FISA court, hey, the fact that, that, that this guy Carter Page, but the fact that he's talking to Russians, really suspicious. Well, the fact that he's serving as a source for U.S. intelligence agents is pretty darn relevant to why he's talking to Russians, because we have lots of sources that are talking to bad guys. And when you don't tell the court that, you're deceiving the court. But it's worse than just deceiving the court. A lawyer at the FBI creates fraudulent evidence, alters an email, that is in turn used as the basis for a sworn statement to the court that the court relies on. Am I stating that accurately? Uh, that's correct. So the intelligence agency said this guy is a source, and he inserted this guy is not a source. This wasn't Jason Bourne. This was Beavis and Butthead. The FBI knew all this was hogwash, and yet they still allowed anti-Trump fake news stories to spread like wildfire while they continued to spy on the president. President Trump's inauguration on January 20th of 2017 meant that both Brennan and Clapper were out of a job. When the curtain was finally pulled back, 
Brennan was revealed to still be a bloated windbag, just a smaller and weaker version of one. Next, Brennan did what any talking head that was full of hot air would do. He and his buddy Clapper got jobs as fake news commentators. Team Hillary's lies in conjunction with the mainstream media's fake news stories launched a whole series of investigations. Crossfire Hurricane had launched on July 31st of 2016, but that was just the beginning because this was the case that launched a thousand shifts. Yes, there's ample evidence of collusion in plain sight. There's plenty of evidence of collusion or conspiracy in plain sight. You can see evidence in plain sight uh, on the issue of collusion. How do you respond to the suggestion made that you going out there before this report came out and saying that there's evidence of collusion and then Mueller comes out and says, we don't find any evidence uh, of conspiracy that what you're saying and what you said is, is irresponsible. Jake, what I've been saying all along is that the evidence that I'm concerned about is in plain sight. <laughs> the New York Times reported that between federal, state, and congressional authorities, there are a staggering 30 separate Trump-related investigations. But of course, there was no deep state conspiracy going on because that would be crazy talk. You better think again, Mr. President. You've been around for 13 months. We've been around since 1908. I know how this game is gonna be played. We're gonna win. You take on the intelligence community. They have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Well, let me give you one bottom line. As a former government official, government's gonna kill this guy. Yep, that's right. There was no deep state conspiracy going on. And General Flynn, well, he wasn't set up either. Michael Flynn was a highly decorated Lieutenant General in the United States Army. Everyone thought he was super awesome. Everyone that is, except for the people on Team Hillary. Team Hillary knew they needed a pound of flesh to give the Russian collusion narrative some teeth. And so they set their sights on the beloved General. The same day the Steele dossier, which contained lies about General Flynn, was published in full on by BuzzFeed, which was on January 10th of 2017, Peter Strzok sent this text to Lisa Page. Honey bunny, I'm sitting here with Bill watching CNN. A ton more out. We're discussing whether now that this is out, we can use it as a pretext to go interview some people. Oh, Lisa, I love you so much. For the next several weeks, Team Hillary held multiple meetings to brainstorm tactics they could use against General Flynn to interrogate him over his benign phone call that he had had back on December 29th with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. Additionally, on January 10th of 2017, Clapper told David Ignatius at the Washington Post words to the effect of, take the kill shot on Flynn. Two days later, the world became aware that Team Hillary committed a felony when they leaked General Flynn's December 29th phone call with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak to the Washington Post. Nothing illegal occurred during General Flynn's phone call, but the article questioned whether or not General Flynn had broken the law by violating the Logan Act. The Logan Act forbids citizens from negotiating with other nations on behalf of the United States without authorization. No one has ever been prosecuted under the Logan Act, and it hadn't even been used since 1852. The idea that an incoming national security advisor speaking with a foreign diplomat was some sort of crime was absolutely ridiculous. But in fact, all of General Flynn's conversations with the Russian ambassador and everybody else were legal. So why did the FBI approach him? They knew what he said. They knew it was legal. The answer is they wanted to frame him and they succeeded. In an attempt to kill the Ignatius story, General Flynn stated, that he had the campaign put out the response that he didn't discuss sanctions with Kislyak at all. That claim was later repeated by Vice President Mike Pence. General Flynn later admitted that this wasn't true and ultimately he would resign a month later stating, quote, unfortunately, because of the fast pace of events, I inadvertently briefed the Vice President-elect and others with incomplete information regarding my phone calls with the Russian ambassador." Unquote. From court documents filed by General Flynn's attorney, Sidney Powell, on January 23rd, the day before the FBI interviewed General Flynn, Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, FBI General Counsel James Baker, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, Trish Anderson, Jen Boone, and David Bowditch strategized to talk with Mr. Flynn in such a way as to keep from alerting him from understanding 
that he was being interviewed in a criminal investigation of which he was the target. Right before the meeting, Lisa Page had texted Peter Strzok, Oh, Pumpkin, I can feel my heart beating harder. I'm so stressed about all the ways this has the potential to go fully off the rails. The following day, at 12.30 p.m., McCabe called Flynn and asked him if it was okay for two agents to come by and talk to him in two hours. McCabe also told Flynn it was better if there were no White House lawyers present. Comey bragged on TV about how he deliberately discarded FBI and DOJ rules by not alerting the White House Counsel's Office that he was sending agents over to interview President Trump's national security advisor. The FBI wanted to send agents into the White House itself to interview a senior official. You would work through the White House counsel and there'd be discussions and approvals and who would be there. And I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. <laughs> It's extremely concerning. It's outrageous government misconduct. The agents deliberately calculated and met to plan and strategize how to ambush interview General Flynn without letting him know he was officially under any kind of criminal investigation to keep him relaxed. And they wanted to be seen as allies when in fact they knew exactly what he had said in his conversations and they intended to create a situation in which anything he said could be used against him later as a false statement without any warnings to that effect whatsoever. Peter Strzok and Joe Pianca were the FBI agents that were sent to interview General Flynn on January 24th of 2017. Following the interrogation, McCabe said that Strzok and Pianca didn't think that Flynn was lying during the interview. And he did not tell them false information. Some of it may have been paused, it may have been nuanced. He did not lie. And indeed, the agents who actual 302s are available said he didn't lie. According to General Flynn's attorney, Sidney Powell, on January 30th of 2017, the DOJ, in an internal memo, cleared General Flynn of being a Russian agent and the documentation existed that showed that then FBI Deputy Director McCabe ruled out Logan Act charges against Flynn in January or February of 2017. You may be asking, how did we go from everyone saying that General Flynn was telling the truth to General Flynn pleading guilty to one count of lying to the FBI? Well, General Flynn took a plea deal in part because he ran out of money and had to sell his home. Additionally, Rod Rosenstein authorized Mueller to go after his son, Michael Flynn Jr., who had a newborn baby at home. General Flynn was worried that his family would be SWAT teamed, just like Roger Stone and Paul Manafort's families had been. So General Flynn fell on his sword to keep them all out of harm's way. And General Flynn didn't lie to the FBI. They just made it seem like he did. Peter Strzok and Joe Pianca recorded their version of what General Flynn said in an FBI summary memo that that is called a 302. A 302 is an utterly ridiculous format that the FBI uses to record what happens in interviews and interrogations. Instead of recording conversations because we have, you know, like technology and stuff, FBI agents take notes of questions and answers and then go back and later turn those notes into a summary memo. This format is prone to human error, and if you testify to something other than their flawed recollection, you can be charged with lying to the FBI. Not recording interviews gives FBI agents the ability to make up whatever they want in order to frame people, and that is exactly what they did to General Flynn. First of all, the 302s were hidden from General Flynn's defense team, which violated the Brady Rule. The Brady Rule is a pretrial discovery rule that was established in 1963 by the United States Supreme Court in Brady v. Maryland. The Brady Rule requires that the prosecution must turn over all exculpatory evidence to the defendant in a criminal case. Exculpatory evidence is evidence that might exonerate the defendant. There were at least six versions of the Flynn 302. The original one that should be dated around the same day as the January 24, 2017 interview still has not been produced. Subsequent ones that have been produced are dated 
February 10th of 2017, February 11th of 2017, February 14th of 2017, February 15th of 2017, and May 31st of 2017. They changed his 302 again and again and again and again until it said exactly what they wanted it to. We know thanks to court documents filed by Sidney Powell that Peter Strzok and Joe Pianca's original handwritten notes taken during the interview didn't line up with the information in General Flynn's 302. Additional questions and answers that were not in the original notes were added weeks and months after the initial interview took place. And the government had also gotten Strzok and Pianca's notes mixed up. They added a definitive statement that General Flynn's did not say something that he had said and another statement that he had elicited some responses to questions about the Ambassador Kislyak, what he had said in response, and there's nothing in the notes that supports that whatsoever. It's made up out of whole cloth. I would encourage everyone to look at the exhibits for themselves. On February 10th of 2017, the news broke attributed to senior intelligence officials that Mr. Flynn had discussed sanctions with Ambassador Kislyak, contrary to what Vice President Pence had said on television previously. Overnight, the most substantive changes were made to the Flynn 302. Those changes added an unequivocal statement that Flynn stated he did not in response to whether Mr. Flynn had asked Kislyak to vote in a certain manner or slow down the UN vote. This is a deceptive manipulation because, as the notes of the agents show, Mr. Flynn was not even sure he had spoken to Russia slash Kislyak on this issue. He had talked to dozens of countries. Second, they added, or Kislyak described any Russian response to a request by Flynn. That question and answer do not appear in the notes, yet it was made into a criminal offense. The typed version of the highly unusual deliberative 302 by that date already included an entire section from whole cloth that also serves as a criminal charge in the information and purported factual basis regarding Russia's response to any request by Flynn. The draft also shows that the agents moved a sentence to make it seem to be an answer to a question it was not. The final 302 dated May 31st of 2017 had even more additions. Notes by both agents state that Mr. Flynn does not remember making four to five calls to Ambassador Kislyak from the Dominican Republic where he was on vacation, but that if he did so, it was because phone service was poor and he kept getting dropped. I don't remember making four to five calls. If I did, lousy place to call. The final 302 states the opposite. Flynn remembered making four to five calls that day about this issue, but that the Dominican Republic was a difficult place to make a call as he kept having connectivity issues. This dramatically demonstrates the wrongheadedness of allowing a 302 to create a federal felony. The notes provide no support for a chunk of the 302 that purports to provide a factual basis for the plea. Two out of the four alleged false statements in the statement of offense are based on what the agents claim Mr. Flynn said or did not say about the response of the Russian ambassador on two separate issues. Even if we assume the skimpy, vague, and ambiguous notes correctly represent anything the agents might claim, the notes provide no support for a question or an answer about the Russian ambassador's response, either to the UN vote or the sanctions. The FBI totally just kept making stuff up months and months and months after the initial interview. And guess who was helping with the editing? Lisa Page. We knew from early on in 2017 that Michael Flynn was, had, did not lie to the FBI. We actually put that in our report. It didn't come out until 2018 after Flynn had already pled. And for some reason, it was redacted. We had to fight in order to get that unredacted. Mm. There were several, several of us as witnesses. We also told the highest levels of DOJ that we had been briefed by the FBI that Flynn didn't lie to the FBI. He did not lie, and in fact, the FBI knew it. Michael Flynn was framed in order to get at Donald Trump. Sally Yates, James Comey, 
Peter Strzok, Andy McCabe, all planned it. What you are watching play out in an American courtroom is one of the most disgraceful events in American criminal justice. With General Flynn being effectively neutralized, Team Hillary next put a bullseye on President Trump's Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. The Washington Post reported on March 1st of 2017 that Attorney General Sessions met with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak at least two times in 2016. Team Hillary then accused Sessions of lying under oath during his Senate confirmation hearing because he said that he had no communication with the Russians. But Sessions' response was to a very specific question from Senator Al Franken regarding Sessions' knowledge about communication between Trump campaign members and the Russians about Russian collusion. The question was not, have you ever spoken to a Russian at any point in your life? Which was how the fake news media falsely framed the issue. CNN just published a story alleging that the intelligence community provided documents to the president-elect last week that included information that, quote, Russian operatives claimed to have compromising personal and financial information about Mr. Trump. These documents also allegedly stated, quote, there was a continuing exchange of information during the campaign between Trump surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government. Now, again, I'm telling you this is it's coming out, so, uh, you know. But if it's true, it's obviously extremely serious. And if there is any evidence that anyone affiliated with the Trump campaign communicated with the Russian government in the course of this campaign, what will you do? Senator Franken, I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have not have communications with the Russians, um, and I'm unable to comment on it. You like Jason Bourne or James Bond movies? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do. <laughs> have, have you ever, in any of these fantastical situations, heard of a plot line so ridiculous that a sitting United States senator and an ambassador of a foreign government colluded at an open setting with hundreds of other people to pull off the greatest caper in the history of Esther. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, uh, Senator Cotton. It's just like through the looking glass. I mean, what is this? I explained how, in good faith, I said I had not met with Russians because they were uh, suggesting I, as a surrogate, had been meeting continuously with Russians. I said I didn't meet with them. And now, the next thing you know, uh, I'm accused of some reception, uh, uh, plotting some sort of uh, influence campaign for the American election. It's just beyond my capability to understand. That. Even though he didn't do anything wrong, Sessions recused himself from investigations into Trump's presidential campaign on March 2nd of 2017. On May 9th of 2017, Rod Rosenstein, produced a memorandum titled Restoring Public Confidence in the FBI, which recommended that Comey be fired over his mishandling of the Clinton email investigation. That same day, President Trump fired Comey. As President of the United States of America, Donald Trump had the legal authority to and could have fired Comey simply because he didn't like the way that Comey's tail stuck out of his yellow suit. President Trump had also been upset with Comey for a number of reasons, including Comey showboating and Comey refusing to publicly state that he was not under investigation, despite Comey telling him he was not under investigation multiple times privately. On May 9th of 2017, right after Comey was fired, Peter Strzok texted Lisa Page. Honey bunny, we need to open the case we've been waiting on now while Andy's acting. We need to lock in Redacted in a formal, chargeable way soon. Andrew McCabe told 60 Minutes that on May 10th, the day after Comey was fired, that he decided that an obstruction of justice investigation into the president needed to be opened. We know that this was a baseless revenge case because on May 11th, 
The day after McCabe decided an obstruction case needed to be opened, McCabe testified before the Senate that there had been no obstruction. Has the dismissal of Mr. Comey in any way impeded, interrupted, stopped, or negatively impacted any of the work, any investigation, or any ongoing projects at the Federal Bureau of Investigations? As you know, Senator, <clears throat> the work of the men and women of the FBI continues despite any um, changes in circumstance, any decisions. Um, so there has been no effort to impede our investigation to date. But McCabe wasn't going to let a little something like no underlying evidence of a crime or obstruction dissuade him. Heck, even Peter Strzok had to admit in a discussion about whether or not he should be on Mueller's special counsel team. Honey Bunny, you and I both know the odds are nothing. If I thought it was likely, I'd be there no question. I hesitate in part because of my gut sense and concern. There's no big there there. Oh Honey Bunny, I can't wait to see you tonight. The FBI under now acting FBI director McCabe called up Bruce Orr and told him to reestablish contact with the progenitor of lies, Christopher Steele, even though the FBI had fired Steele back in November of 2016. May 16th of 2017 was a dark day for America. It started off with Robert Mueller visiting the White House for an interview to replace the newly fired Comey as director of the FBI. Bob Mueller had a telephone with him, and it is now believed by many people that the phone was used to broadcast the meeting between the president Rod Rosenstein and Bob Mueller back to FBI headquarters where they recorded the conversation with the president. He left that phone in the Oval Office after the meeting. Now, why would you leave your phone in the president's office after a meeting? How it was to continue to record what right. happened after they left. How did he get in there with a the phone? We always have ours taken out. That's right. <laughs> you have to put them in a locker so that something's fishy right, yeah. right there. That same day, the New York Times produced an article titled, Comey Memo Says Trump Asked Him to End Flynn Investigation. Comey had been secretly writing memos of his conversations with the president, and he made sure a number of them were leaked to the media after his dismissal. Some of those memos were up classified or retroactively classified because government officials determined that they contained classified information. This leak was done by Comey in order to get back at President Trump for firing him with the hope that Comey would be able to get a special counsel assigned. So I asked a friend of mine to share the content of the memo with a reporter. Didn't do it myself for a variety of reasons, but I asked him to because I thought that might prompt the appointment of a special counsel. On May 9th, Jim Comey is fired. When we deposed him after he was fired, he told us all the way up until May 9th, they still didn't have anything. And that's exactly what Michael Horowitz told us in this report. Even if you accept Horowitz that there was a proper predication for starting this, by January they should have stopped. And because they didn't stop, we wind up getting the Bob Mueller investigation and what that put our country through for over two years. Comey's memos pointed to a conversation that supposedly took place on February 14th of 2017, the day after General Flynn resigned. Comey stated that the president had said in reference to looking at Flynn's conduct that, quote, I hope you can let this go, unquote. The president denied that he said this, but even if he had, any lawyer worth their salt could tell you that hoping something happens is not the same as giving an order. If, if this seems to be something the president's trying to get you to drop it, this seems like a pretty light touch to drop it, to bring it up at that moment, the day after he had just fired Flynn, to come back in and say, I hope we can let this go, but then it never reappears again. Did, did it slow down your investigation or any investigation that may or may not be occurring with Michael Flynn? No. Nevertheless, Comey was now insisting that I hope you can let this go was in order to shut down a federal investigation. And President Trump made multiple statements saying that if anyone on his team colluded with the Russians, he wanted to know about it and wanted the investigation to be conducted. I, I was interested in your comment that you made as well, that the president said to you, if there were some satellite associates of his that did something wrong, it would be good to find that out. That the president seemed to talk to you specifically on March the 30th and say, I'm frustrated that the word is not getting out that I'm not under investigation, 
But if there are people that are in my circle that are, let's finish the investigation. Is that how you took it as yes, well? Yes, sir. Yes. But what makes this truly sinister is when you remember that General Flynn never lied to the FBI. And back on January 30th of 2017, the DOJ, in an internal memo, cleared General Flynn of being a Russian agent and documentation existed that showed that then FBI Deputy Director McCabe ruled out Logan Act charges against Flynn in January of 2017. Instead of telling President Trump that General Flynn had been cleared of Russian collusion, Comey hid the truth from the president and then cried that the president committed obstruction of justice. They knew there was no Logan Act violation. They exonerated him completely of being an agent of Russia by the end of January. And yet Mr. Comey still runs to the White House on February 14th and conjures up the entire obstruction of justice narrative against the president when Flynn had been cleared of everything long before that. Finally, on May 16th of 2017, Andy McCabe and Rod Rosenstein, along with other top government officials, held a meeting where they openly discussed wearing a wire while talking to President Trump. Rod offered to wear a wire, said he could wear one. He was never, you know, searched or patted down when he went in and out of the White House. He claims, he claimed later that he was joking. Other people in the room said he was not joking. What, what was your opinion? I never had the sense that Rod was joking. It was an offer that he made on more than one occasion. And removing the president via the 25th Amendment. You were discussing the 25th Amendment, which removes a duly elected president from office. So you know? Rod bring, brought up the 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment grants the vice president and a majority of cabinet members the authority to declare a president physically or mentally incapacitated. The vice president would then become the president. The 25th Amendment was created because of situations like when James Garfield was shot in 1881 but clung to life for another two and a half months. During those final months, Chester Arthur, the vice president, remained in Washington but avoided any appearance that he had assumed the mantle of office. The 25th Amendment is for situations like the president being in a coma, not for launching a potentially treasonous coup because you don't like who the president is. The day after this meeting, which was May 17th of 2017, Deputy Attorney General Ron Rosenstein appointed former FBI Director Robert Mueller as special counsel to head an investigation into Russian interference. On day one, Mueller goes in there and they give him the case file and he sees that they've got nothing. Actually, they have less than nothing. Their spies reported back that nobody wanted anything to do with Russian collusion. The primary subsource, the guy that provided the information to Steele for the dossier, admitted that the dossier was a hoax and the dossier was the reason why they were able to get the FISA warrant to spy on the Trump campaign in the first place. Instead of going in front of the people, picking up the microphone, Dear America, this is Bob Mueller. This case is a flaming pile of dog <laughs> I'm very sorry, America. We're moving on. That's not what he does. We're, we're walking the yellow brick road. I gotta lay little yellow bricks first, though, okay? Bob Mueller then investigates the president for over a year on a charge he already knows is a hoax. They also continue to use a source, Christopher Steele, who they've already been told by the FBI by a source in January whose information is complete garbage. The FBI allegedly fires him and the Mueller team continues to use him as he has an FBI handler throughout the time he's allegedly fired. The warrant approved to continue spying on the Trump team after Mueller's appointed is based on information Mueller knows is a hoax. And not only that, there's approvals to continue to spy on Carter Page, repeating the 17 lies from the prior FISA warrant applications, lies and omissions, categorical lies where they lied to a FISA court. And the biggest lie of all that Mueller does nothing to stop is that Carter Page has been contacting Russians illicitly and could be a spy when he was contacting Russians on behalf of the CIA. Zero Integrity Mueller then loaded the special counsel team full of Trump-hating Democrats. Mueller himself was the only known Republican. Mueller shouldn't have been leading them because President Trump told Mueller why he fired Comey when Mueller went to the White House on May 16th of 2017, which was the day before Rod Rosenstein assigned him as special counsel. Hearing that reason made Mueller a witness in his own investigation, which is illegal. He may not be the brightest fellow, 
Uh, but I have to say, I think he's smarter than to put himself before a committee in which Republicans will be questioning him, uh, as, as you all say, closely. Millions of Americans today maintain genuine concerns about your work in large part because of the infamous and widely publicized bias of your investigating team members, which we now know included 14 Democrats and zero Republicans. That team of Democrat investigators you hired donated more than $60,000 to the Hillary Clinton campaign and other Democratic candidates. Your team also included Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, which have been discussed today, and they had the lurid text messages that confirmed they openly mocked and hated Donald Trump and his supporters, and they vowed to take him out. Kevin Kleinsmith, Peter Strzok, and Lisa Page were eventually removed for their undeniable bias. And once again, special counsel group members Zanab Ahmad and Andrew Weissman knew Bruce Orr had been transmitting dossier information from Christopher Steele and Glenn Simpson prior to the election, which should have disqualified them from serving. Andrew Weissman was an infamous dirty trickster. His critics have accused him of having unethical behavior, manipulating the legal system, misleading jurists, intimidating innocent people, and making up crimes that don't exist to charge people with. Weissman was so bad, he'd had multiple convictions overturned upon appeal, including with a unanimous vote at the Supreme Court level. Andrew Weissman attended Hillary Clinton's election night party. Weissman wrote an email to Deputy Attorney General Yates stating, I am so proud and in awe regarding her disobeying a direct order from the president. Ms. Jeannie Ree represented Hillary Clinton in litigation regarding personal emails originating, originating from Clinton's time as Secretary of State. Aaron Zelby, the guy sitting next to you, represented Justin Cooper, a Clinton aide who destroyed one of Clinton's mobile devices. I can't imagine a single prosecutor or judge that I have ever appeared in front of would be comfortable with these circumstances where over half of the prosecutorial team had a direct relationship to the opponent of the person being investigated. Trust me, if there was collusion or obstruction to be found, these guys would have found it. I believe that Team Hillary would have continued to investigate President Trump right up until the 2020 election, but there was a new sheriff in town. On February 14th of 2019, Bill Barr became the new Attorney General. He was just as smart as he was tough. Barr had a great sense of humor and he played a mean bagpipe. Now, how was that for an icebreaker? <laughs> when people tried to attack him, he simply outwitted them and made them look silly. The special counsel team concluded their investigation under Barr's leadership. Well, 647 days and more than $30 million later, the world learned what those of us that were following closely knew all along, that there had been no obstruction and no collusion. It really was that simple. There had been no obstruction and no collusion. Mueller didn't find sufficient evidence to charge the president with criminal conspiracy, and when he refused to make a determination on whether or not President Trump obstructed justice, Mueller's inaction kicked the obstruction of justice question back to Attorney General Bill Barr, who reviewed the evidence and determined that there had been no obstruction, and even Rod Rosenstein signed off on it, agreeing that there had been no obstruction. Deputy Attorney General uh, Rosenstein and I met with him, along with Ed O'Callaghan, uh, who is the principal associate deputy, and he made it very clear uh, several times that that was not his position. He, he was not saying that but for the OLC opinion, he would have found a crime. He made it clear that he had not made the determination that there was a crime. But Team Hillary needed to muddy the waters and keep the heat on President Trump, and that's why the Mueller report was created. The Mueller report was a 448-page smear campaign against the president. It was split into two volumes. Volume 1 covered collusion and Volume 2 covered obstruction. It was designed to be a roadmap to impeachment and to sow confusion in the minds of the public. There were deceptive edits of transcripts and entire issues that were completely ignored. They were supposed to be looking at Russian election interference, but they turned a blind eye to the real Russian interference that took place on the side of Team Hillary. The special counsel team worked extra hard behind the scenes to pull the wool over the eyes of the citizens of the United States by tricking people into believing that President Trump obstructed justice.
All right, guys, we got nothing on obstruction and nothing on collusion. But if we say that, our friends are going to be in jail faster than a speeding Clinton body count bullet. We're totally screwed on collusion. We're going to have to admit that no one in the Trump campaign colluded with the Russians. But I have concocted a nefarious plan that relies on the media and the congressional Democrats supporting us while we twist and misinterpret the law. We're going to be distorting obstruction of justice and the OLC, Office of Legal Counsel Guidelines. I've got a list of 10 instances that can be misinterpreted as obstruction of justice to help our cause. Trust me, I want to see Trump go down more than anybody. I was there that night at her victory party, you see. She was dressed all in black with a tall pointy hat. Her green skin had a special glow upon it that could only be described as breathtaking. And when the unthinkable happened, I wept. I wept uncontrollably. I cried more tears than there were drops of water in the whole of the ocean. More than anything, I wanted to take Hillary gently into my arms and console her in that carnal, primal way that a man consoles a woman. But alas, I was too late. She had flown away on her broom. If you think that was a fairly written report, you know, imagine who was writing it. Uh, Andrew Weissman, who was crying at uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, funeral or whatever that was, you know, when she, when she lost. My memory is not what it used to be. My memory is not what it used to be. Which president appointed you to become the United States Attorney for Massachusetts? Which senator? Which president? Oh, which president? I think that was President Bush. Um, according to my notes, it was President Ronald Reagan had the honor to do so. When you talk about the, the firm that produced the Steele reporting, uh, the name of the firm that produced that was Fusion GPS. Is that correct? Well, I, I'm not familiar uh, uh, with, uh, with that. I, well, I, let, you, let me just help you. Up, it it I, was. I, it's, not, it's not a trick question. Right? It, it was Fusion GPS. And to not know who Fusion GPS is, you know, give me a break. The reason why uh, he didn't know, because he wasn't really engaged in this investigation the whole time. And when you see Bob Mueller in that pathetic display, you know what happened. Weissman did it all. He made sure that Roger Stone was arrested in the middle of the night with SWAT teams. Bob Mueller slept through this event from beginning to end, and today, his ignominious finale showed him asleep at the hearing. As you know, obstruction of justice is broken down into three elements. One, there was a pending federal judicial proceeding. Two, the defendant knew of the proceeding. And three, the defendant had corrupt intent to interfere with or attempted to interfere with the proceeding. Outside of the rare confession, the third element, corrupt intent, makes obstruction very hard to prove when there was no crime committed. Two people can look at the exact same situation and interpret the motives of a defendant completely differently. And remember, for obstruction of justice to stick, it has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is easy to find when you're innocent. Let's look at one of the examples on my list. Don McGahn didn't carry out an obstruction that wasn't and obstruction. saved him. He could have fired Mueller. Mueller. He had a perfect right to fire Mueller. Mueller, Mueller, at that time, he had several good reasons to fire Mueller. Mueller had substantial conflicts of interest. He had hired a staff that was so prejudiced, it shocks any prosecutor who's there. He hired a person who was the chief counsel to the Clinton Foundation to investigate Donald Trump. My God, if I were investigating Hillary Clinton, and I hired the person who ran the Trump Foundation, I think the media would go nuts on me. So that was a legitimate reason to want to fire Mueller for a very, very bad judgment. Remember, he's the President of the United States. Mueller is not an independent counsel. Mueller works for the Justice Department. He could have been fired at any moment. And unless you could show that he wasn't going to replace him with somebody to take over the investigation like you did with Comey, you'd have no obstruction. There you go. Reasonable doubt. And you can make the same argument with the other nine instances I have here. If we had to take this obstruction case to court, we'd be laughed at. Mightily. That's why we can't recommend indicting the president on obstruction. So instead, we're not going to make a determination on obstruction. We'll leave it up in the air and issue a one-sided report that's full of lies and smears the president. The media and the people who hate President Trump won't have the ability to look at the situation objectively. And they'll cry he obstructed justice when we all know he didn't. Ha 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 ha. They use tricky language to pretend that Mueller couldn't make a recommendation on obstruction because the Office of Legal Counsel guidelines say you can't indict a sitting president. And while they say you can't indict a sitting president, they don't say that you can't recommend charges, which is exactly 
what Ken Starr did with the Bill Clinton impeachment. Mueller could have written up, just like Ken Starr did many years ago, I find the, the president did this and he's guilty. I find he committed perjury here and he's guilty. And, you know, one, one after another with Ken Starr. And he could have done that. That doesn't mean that the president gets indicted. That means that he said he found sufficient evidence for an indictment. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. A pres president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. Those were the principles under which we operated, and from them we concluded that we would, would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. And I'd like to ask you the reason, again, that you did not indict Donald Trump is because of OLC opinion stating that you cannot indict a sitting president, correct? Uh, that is correct. I want to add one correction to my testimony this morning. I want to go back to one thing that was said this morning by Mr. Liu, who said, and I quote, you didn't charge the president because of the OLC opinion. That is not the correct way to say it. As we say in the report, and as I said at the opening, we did not reach a determination as to whether the president committed a crime. You noted eight times in your report that you had a legal duty under the regulations to either prosecute or decline charges. Despite this, you disregarded that duty. You made the decision on the Russian interference. You, you, you couldn't have indicted the president on that, and you made the decision on that. But when it came to obstruction, you threw a bunch of stuff up against the wall to see what would stick. Well, and that I, is fundamentally unfair. That. Next, they took advantage of the fact that exoneration means something different to lay people than it does to lawyers. When the average Joe hears the word exoneration, he thinks it means the same thing as being innocent or being acquitted, but it doesn't. The actual legal definition of exoneration is to lift, remove the stain of being called out for blame, liability, or punishment. It is more than just freeing an accused person of the responsibility for a criminal or otherwise illegal or wrongful act. It is publicly stating that this accused should never have been accused in the first place. Exoneration is a much higher standard than acquittal. Acquittal is when someone is freed by a court generally as a result of lack of evidence. In order to be exonerated, the prosecutor has to say that he felt that you never should have been accused in the first place. And it didn't matter what the evidence was, under no circumstances were we ever going to say that President Trump should have never been accused in the first place. Ha <laughs> ha! If people had to be exonerated in order to be found not guilty, imagine how messed up that would be. Bob is accused of robbing a bank, but he's innocent. The prosecutor doesn't have any evidence that Bob robbed the bank, but the prosecutor doesn't like guys with handlebar mustaches. He thinks all guys with handlebar mustaches are shady, so he refuses to state that Bob should have never been charged in the first place. Innocent Bob is now in jail due to his questionable choices in facial hair. That's called being guilty until proven innocent. It's the exact opposite of our law. Being innocent until proven guilty. And it's exactly what we're doing to President Trump. Ha <laughs> ha. Really, the only time we ever need to say that someone never should have been accused in the first place is when a person who's been convicted of a crime is officially cleared based on new evidence of innocence. Pardons can be forms of exoneration. President Trump never went to court and was found guilty, so there's no reason for him to need to be exonerated. When we say we do not exonerate him, what we are actually saying is nonsensical. But we are saying it because, and now this is the clever part, we are saying it because people that do not know what exoneration actually means will think that if President Trump wasn't exonerated, then that means he's guilty. When legally, we're not saying that at all. Ha 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 ha! Now marvel at the beauty of this carefully crafted statement from the Mueller report. Accordingly, while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. Since we all know that President Trump never needed to be and never would be exonerated, all this statement really says is that we didn't find that the president committed a crime. But that's not how people will read it. Ha 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 ha! The Attorney General in the appointment order gave you powers and authorities that are reside in the Attorney General. And what I'm putting up here is the United States Code. This is where the Attorney General gets his power and the Constitution and the annotated ver cases of these, which we've searched. And we got the criminal law textbook from your law school. Mr. Mueller 
Nowhere in these, because we had them scanned, is there a process or description on exonerate. If the Attorney General doesn't have the power to exonerate, then you don't have the power to exonerate. And so this is the part that I don't understand. If your report is to the Attorney General, you don't have to tell him that you're not exonerating the president. Next I'm, week I'm, the I, no, we included in the report for exactly that reason. He may not know it, and he should know it. So you believe that the attorney, Bill Barr, believes that somewhere in the hallways of the Department of Justice, there's an office of exoneration? No, that's not what I said. Well, I believe he knows, and I don't believe you put that in there for, for Mr. Barr. I think you put that in there for exactly what I'm going to discuss next. And that is, so the Washington Post yesterday, when speaking of your report, the article said Trump could not be exonerated of trying to obstruct the investigation itself. Now, Mr. Mueller, what you know is that this can't say Mueller exonerated Trump because you don't have the power or authority to exonerate Trump. You have no more power to declare him exonerated than you have the power to declare him Anderson Cooper. The statement about exoneration is misleading and it's meaningless and it, it colors this investigation. You, in the corner, add that list of 10 possible obstruction charges to the report. It'll be like a raw shark ink block test. People who want to see crimes will see crimes. If we're really lucky, the Democrats will be able to use this to impeach President Trump, and then hopefully none of our friends will wind up in the pokey. Here, I'm Mueller, sign this. Tell President Reagan the British are coming. It's perfect. The people will be left confused and fighting amongst each other once we tell them that while we do not, not, not recommend obstruction charges, we also do not, 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 not exonerate the president. And this plan all works perfectly just so long as Robert Mueller never has to testify. The investigation was over and the president was innocent, but Democrats like Nadler wouldn't stop. They wanted Trump team members to return and testify in front of them again and again and again so they could retry the case in Congress. The Mueller report concluded there was no collusion, no obstruction, because the report failed to provide damning information against the president. The majority claims we need to dig deeper. Deeper than the two years of investigation conducted by what is considered a prosecutorial dream team because that probe ended without criminal charges against the president or his family. The special counsel closed up shop without giving Democrats anything to deliver <laughs> to their base. Two years, 19 lawyers, 40 FBI agents, $25 million to look at all things Trump. Once Mueller gives an outcome they don't like, they want to take Mueller's work product and politicize it. They just want an outcome. It doesn't matter how you get Trump. It doesn't matter if you trick the FISA court. It doesn't matter if you infiltrate the campaign. The goal is to stop Trump and the rules don't matter. This is a very dangerous time in American history. These disgusting politicians didn't give a crap about what these men and women had already been through. Early MAGA people who all of us, about 50 of us and the kids and the, you know, the, the wives and kids and husbands all got caught up in this, but a lot of people lost jobs. And I know one family where both the mother and the father lost the job. Everybody lost business and people lost really, you know, appointments to the president's senior staff, like, you know, uh, assistant secretary level of major departments, it really decimated a lot of lives. It's a horrible thing when you have to represent somebody who's innocent. I mean, I could see in his eyes sometimes he would say to me, I didn't do anything with the Russians. I didn't do anything. What are they, how could they do this? He handled it better than anyone could possibly handle it. The only time he would really get upset, not about him, but about his family and about his co-workers and the people who came to Washington to change things and left having spent a lot of money, uh, completely upset and, 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 and dispirited. There were 30 different investigations going on all at the same time and people were testifying in front of various groups. Multiple families had to sell their homes to cover mounting court costs. After a House Permanent Select Committee of Intelligence uh, hearing in uh, 2017 and then a Senate committee hearing uh, on Tuesday and now I'm, I'm uh, sitting before the Mueller team on Wednesday we're at about $125,000. I want to tell you, I we were on our way out of our out of our homes. $125,000 more I make in a year. People got deep into the five figures, really deep into the six figures. Uh, but you know, Roger, Paul, General Flynn, all these fellas, they're spending millions and millions of dollars. There was damage to reputations and death threats. Representative Jackie Spear brought my name up and my wife's name up in the hearing and called me Putin's image maker. The threats to our family came 
uh, just one after the other from there, death threat after death threat. One guy called me after that hearing on the phone and said, I know you're not home. We're going to burn your house down with your wife and children inside. These death threats haven't stopped since that day. No one in the Trump campaign was indicted on anything having to do with Russian collusion. If the special counsel thought you ripped a tag off a mattress, you were going to jail. George Papadopoulos spent 14 days in jail for lying to the FBI in part because he spoke to them without a lawyer and got the date he met Mifsud wrong. Michael Cohen, President Trump's former personal attorney, received three years in jail for multiple charges, including tax evasion and lying to Congress. Roger Stone is facing up to nine years for multiple counts, including obstruction, lying to Congress, and intimidating a witness who said he wasn't intimidated. Paul Manafort, President Trump's former campaign chairman, received seven and a half years on a variety of counts, including tax fraud. Manafort initially had a FISA warrant taken out on him back in 2014 for his work in the Ukraine, but it had lapsed due to lack of evidence. Isn't it funny how he wasn't charged with anything until he decided to work for the Trump campaign? They put Paul Manafort into solitary confinement and brought him out nine times, nine, nine and said, are you ready to tell us that the president knew about the Trump Tower meeting prior to the meeting? Which wouldn't have been a crime in any event, but they were going to make it one. But, I mean, they tried to get people to give false information about the president so that they could bring the collusion charge. Indicting people for process crimes gave the special counsel the ability to say, hey, there might not have been any collusion with Russia, but look at all these bad guys we found, so our investigation was totally legitimate. But it wasn't. As Mueller was, uh, was conducting this operation, this investigation, as he built that investigation out, and when he found things that it didn't directly do with the scope memo, what he was supposed to be investigating with, he sent those off, right? So he busted people like, like Michael Cohen, uh, Trump's uh, attorney. That's a, good, that's a good example. Well, wait a second. You were looking at intel. You were looking at leaks of classified information like Michael Flynn, General Flynn's conversation with the Russian ambassador that leaked out all over the place. There was no criminal referral there. While all of this phony Russian collusion nonsense was going on, the news became so partisan that if you were watching conservative outlets, you were getting the truth but if you're watching liberal outlets, you're watching nothing but lies. As if there are no shoes on the Trump human centipede that are not about Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. It's clear that Mueller is now connecting the dots. Donald Trump's done. He's done. There's no question about it. He's got to know his future looks like it's behind bars. We have a treasonous president. The presidency is effectively a Russian op. And there was no presumption of innocence or interest in the truth. Collusion. 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 If there was not collusion, there was at least the effort to collude. There was collusion. If they just do their work and do their job, they will find out it was collusion. And this embarrassing excuse for news coverage didn't just stop at the Russian collusion narrative. It extended to everything. According to a new report from Axios, President Trump has been very interested in a brilliant plan to stop hurricanes. Drop a nuclear bomb on them. This morning, the president tweeted from the G7 summit in France calling the story ridiculous. They couldn't even let the man have a 4th of July parade. So what is the message Donald Trump is trying to send by rolling tanks down Constitution Avenue? The message is a threat, but it's always a threat when you roll out your military. But it's to whom is the threat? And I suspect that the threat is to his fellow Americans. This kind of hysteria led in part to the popularization of two terms fake news media, and Trump derangement syndrome. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. When was the last time an actor assassinated a president? Kathy Griffin intended to create a national firestorm with her bloody beheading stunt this week. She did, and it backfired resulting in public scorn, the loss of sponsorships and gigs. And even Griffin admitted she went too far in a video posted online. But today, she wasn't very contrite, claiming she was the one who was wrong. I'm gonna be honest, he broke me. He broke me. He broke me. And then I was like, no, this isn't right. It's just not right. 
Oh my God. Honestly. And it wasn't just celebrities that suffered from Trump derangement syndrome. This is a sadness. It is a, a mourning moment. And it is, a, it is a moment filled with fear. This was a white lash. It was a white lash against a black president in part. Apparently the president gets two scoops. You know, everyone else around the table gets one. Uh, and no word if there were sprinkles. Donald Trump allowed right-wing Christians to finally vote for Caligula, Judas, and the Golden Calf. He looked like a thug. He looked like a goon. You look at the handshake. Uh, you look with look at look at this. Just what a thug! It's, but it's just, what an embarrassment! Look, he's mauling him. I Donald know. Trump again being a schmuck. Is this president trying to impersonate Hugo Chavez, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Vladimir Putin? Love is the single most important word that Donald Trump does not understand, and very sadly for him, it's possible that he has never felt this in his entire life. Feel better? Somewhat. You want a pacifier? The president said that we will fly our flags at half mast until August 8th. That's 8 8. The numbers 8 8 are very significant in neo Nazi and white supremacy movement. Why? Because the letter H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. And to them, the numbers 8 8 together stand for Heil. Hitler. No one's thinking about this. But as chilling as that is to hear, Frank, we're going to keep asking you to come back. Trump is as destructive a person in this century as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao were in the last century. He may be responsible for many more million deaths than they were. Trump could offer Alaska to the Russians in exchange for support in the next election, or decide to move to Mar-a-Lago permanently and let Jared Kushner run the country. Trump derangement syndrome, out of control. Remember, if your dog bites, if the bee stings, if the baby cries and you're feeling sad, it's all President Trump's fault. Now, according to the editorial board of the New York Times, Hurricane Florence is also President Trump's fault. I'm not making this up. Look at the headline on your screen. Another hur hurricane is about to batter our coast. Trump is complicit. The Washington Post cited studies from Media Research Center and Harvard University's Shorstein Center that both concluded that the mainstream media's coverage was overwhelmingly negative of President Trump. The Harvard study looked at his first 100 days and reported that Trump received three times the amount of coverage of any prior president, with 80% of that coverage being negative in nature. The Media Research Center looked at a different time frame, but found the coverage of President Trump to be greater than 90% negative. I don't know if the leftist media was willfully ignorant or woefully ignorant, but it was insane. They unfairly edited him to twist his words, constantly took things out of context, and lied about him being a racist. The president is not messing up here. He did not trip and accidentally praise white supremacists and neo-Nazis and pro-Confederate demonstrators who actually killed somebody this weekend. We also learned today that the president continues to believe, against all the evidence, that there were very fine people on both sides. He's trying to gaslight us again, asking us to believe something contrary to what you and I and everybody can see with our own ears. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence. It has no place in America. The driver of the car is a disgrace to himself, his family, and this country. The driver of the car is a murderer. And what he did was a horrible, horrible, inexcusable thing. You, you had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. I've condemned neo-Nazis. I've condemned many different groups. Following day, it looked like they had some rough, bad people. Neo-Nazis, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Like well, no, George Washington was a slave owner. 
Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? And you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Now, in the other group also, you had some fine people, but you also had troublemakers, and you see them come with the, with the black outfits, and with the helmets, and with the baseball bats. You, got a, you, had a lot of bad, you had a lot of bad people in the other group, too. You had a group on one side, and you had a group on the other, and they came at each other with clubs, and it was vicious, and it was horrible. I thought what took place was a horrible moment for our country. It got so bad that the media just started making up fake news stories. The media, facts were only an afterthought. Any anonymous source, yes, they believed. Like BuzzFeed's bombshell about the president directing Michael Cohen to lie, which Mueller's report exposed as totally false, or NPR being embarrassed after it lied about John Jr.'s Senate testimony, or McClatchy blatantly wrong about Michael Cohen's trip to Prague, it never happened, or The Guardian reporting a fake conspiracy about Mueller and Julian Assange. Three CNN employees forced to resign after reporting an untrue Russia-related story about our friend, the Mooch, Anthony Scaramucci, or Brian Ross leaving ABC after a fake news story about Trump and Russia that actually impacted negatively the stock market. It was fake hysteria about a Russian spy in the White House, or Bloomberg forced to correct their story about Trump and Deutsche Bank, and the New York Times had to walk back claims about Paul Manafort sharing polling data with a Russian oligarch. And don't forget the Washington Post having to correct their story about Russians hacking a Vermont utility, which wasn't true. Uh, he's attacking the fact that a reporter, you see Dave Weigel there, had suggested it was not a large crowd. He was using a photograph that was taken at a, apparently hours before the event. Number four, you see the bus there of Dr. King. Time Magazine falsely reported that the president had removed that bus from the Oval Office. Number three, the president, in his words, says CNN falsely reported that candidate Donald Trump and his son, Donald Trump Jr., had gotten special access to hacked documents from WikiLeaks before they were made public. That was not true. Number two, it's ABC News' it's Brian Ross. Remember that he got suspended. That report suggested that General Flynn was going to tell the special counsel, Robert Mueller, that there was Russian collusion dating back to the campaign. That was not true. The problem, of course, is that the stock market had had a bit, a bit of a crash uh, after that news. And number one, this is interesting, New York Times columnist Paul Krugman said that the economy would never recover from the Trump victory. But the American public saw through their lies and their ratings plummeted. You are now at 13th place in national ratings behind Nick at Night, which is at 11. I'm Tucker Carlson Monday, gets 4 think... million viewers. You barely scratch oh, 800,000. Hopefully soon, the only people left watching the fake news media will be the people that you couldn't convince that the guy they've been sending their money to with the Nigerian accent really isn't the Prince of Norway. Social media giants play their part by shadow banning, suspending, and outright banning conservative voices that were in defense of President Trump. I'll get you, my pretty. And your little frog, too. And they really got the little frog. Two weeks after Donald Trump Jr. posted a Trump Pepe meme, the Anti-Defamation League declared the beloved little green frog is a symbol of hate. And Vanity Fair ran with the headline, Donald Trump Jr. shares white supremacist meme. I guess they decided to ignore the fact that one of their white supremacists was a prominent African-American neurosurgeon. Everything Trump supporters did or said was labeled as racist too, despite there being tons of minority Trump supporters. People from politicians to just regular citizens wearing MAGA hats were kicked out of restaurants and shouted down. We saw the rise of Antifa, a far left terrorist organization that became the darlings of the fake news media. Lunatic leftists began assaulting politicians and Trump supporters. And crazy liberal politicians supported these actions. When they go low, we kick them. That's what this new Democratic Party is about. All right, man. Please get up in the face of some Congress people. Yeah, we know where you we live. Know you, man. We know where you live. And if you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, in a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome. We believe survivors. 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 We believ
You cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's why I believe if we are fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate, that's when civility can start again. But until then, the only thing that the Republicans seem to recognize and respect is strength. Congressman Steve Scalise was shot and badly wounded and is now in stable condition at the hospital along with two very courageous Capitol Police officers. There is no reason to have all of this strife and violence going on. We are not enemies. We are brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and friends and neighbors. The deep state has pitted us against each other to distract us from their crimes. Have you ever thought about what it would look like if we had a president that really did go after political corruption? He'd have to be an outsider. Someone that didn't get rich by taking bribes for political favors. Someone that would question why so many members of Congress became multimillionaires on an upper middle class salary. Someone that would expose their nihilism and pay for play schemes. I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting a billion. I'm going to be leaving here. I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. Would this president be welcome with open arms? What about the corporations that paid money to those politicians? Would they be happy about someone preventing them from buying influence? No, of course not. This is what it looks like when you drain the swamp. You are mercilessly attacked on all sides. And the utterly despicable way that President Trump has been treated would have broken a lesser man. Our movement is about replacing a failed and corrupt political establishment with a new government controlled by you, the American people. The Washington establishment and the financial and media corporations that fund it exist for only one reason, to protect and enrich itself. The political establishment that is trying to stop us is the same group responsible for our disastrous trade deals. They've stripped away these towns bare and raided the wealth for themselves and taken our jobs away out of our country, never to return unless I'm elected president. Anyone who challenges their control is deemed a sexist, a racist, a xenophobe, and morally deformed. The Clinton machine is at the center of this power structure. We've seen this firsthand in the WikiLeaks documents in which Hillary Clinton meets in secret with international banks to plot the destruction of U.S. sovereignty in order to enrich these global financial powers, her special interest friends, and her donors. Honestly, she should be locked up. The most powerful weapon deployed by the Clintons is the corporate media. Hillary Clinton is also given approval and veto power over quotes written about her in the New York Times. They definitely do not do that to me. In my former life, I was an insider as much as anybody else. And I still know what it's like to be an insider. It's not bad. Now I'm being punished for leaving the special club and revealing to you the terrible things that are going on having to do with our country. They knew they would throw every lie they could at me and my family and my loved ones. They knew they would stop at nothing to try to stop me. But I never knew it would be this vile, that it would be this bad, that it would be this vicious. Nevertheless, I take all of these slings and arrows gladly for you. I take them for our movement so that we can have our country back. I didn't need to do this, folks, believe me. Believe me, I built a great company and I had a wonderful life. I could have enjoyed the fruits and benefit of years of successful business deals and businesses for myself and my family.
instead of going through this absolute horror show of lies. I'm doing it because this country has given me so much, and I feel so strongly that it's my turn to give back to the country that I love. But I also know that it's not about me. It's about all of you, and it's about our country. The only thing that can stop this corrupt machine is you. The only force strong enough to save our country is us. The only people brave enough to vote out this corrupt establishment is you, the American people. We will take back this country for you, and we will make America great again. The deep state loves to accuse you of doing the crimes that they themselves have committed. They investigated the Trump campaign for exactly what the Clinton campaign did. Supposedly, the Trump campaign was colluding with the Russians to get dirt on Hillary, but it was actually the Clinton campaign and the DNC that paid a former British spy to get dirt on Trump from Russians. And the truth was, and still is, being hidden from the public by a willful and complicit media, making Spygate the greatest story never told. Imagine if you find out you're the President of the United States, all you did was win an election, and you find out the massive machinery of the federal government with the ability to slap bracelets on you in the form of handcuffs, take your life and your freedom, was turned against you. Folks, this happened. This is the biggest scandal of our generation. There's no close second. This is, makes Watergate look like romper room. We saw protocol violated in both the Hillary Clinton email investigation and then also in the genesis of the Trump-Russia investigation. And it is ludicrous that you had all of the exact same people that paved a yellow brick road for Hillary Clinton all of a sudden ending up on the FBI's Trump-Russia investigation and then recruited by Robert Mueller. Director Comey's been fired. Deputy Director McCabe fired, lied three times under oath according to the Inspector General. FBI counsel Jim Baker demoted and left currently under investigation by the Justice Department. Lisa Page demoted and left. Peter Strzok, deputy head of counterintelligence, demoted and fired. Peter Strzok, the guy who ran the Clinton investigation and the Russian investigation. There was certainly a failure of leadership at the upper echelon of the FBI. It has been evident from day one that there was a brazen plot to exonerate Hillary Clinton illegally, and then if she lost the election, to frame Donald Trump. This dossier was a knowing part of that. It was created by Hillary Clinton. It was created knowingly by John Brennan as part of a scheme to do everything they could to harm Donald Trump. There are going to be indictments. There's going to be grand juries. John Brennan isn't going to need one lawyer. He's going to need five. We have to have real action taken against these people who did this because we can't afford for this ever to happen again. The most powerful intelligence operations ever built in the history of the planet, tens of billions of dollars a year that are supposed to keep this country safe, were turned and used on a political campaign. That should never, ever happen in this country. The President of the United States of America was spied on and framed by members of his predecessor's administration. It was outrageous. It was disgusting. It was disgraceful. And worst of all, worst of all, it was un-American. The damage they did was so insidious and so pervasive that there will be people that go to their graves still believing that their fellow citizens elected a Russian agent to lead this great nation. The term beneath contempt was specifically created for people like these. If they are allowed to get away with doing this to an American president, just think about what they will be able to get away with doing to you. We have not seen a thing like this in all the history of our country, and we all better pray to God that we never do again. All hail the witch in the north! I'm here to tell you that you've had the power to go home all this time! Really? No! <laughs> I'm melting! I'm melting! I'm melting! Oh, what a world! 
What a world, what a world. Ping pong. Make it Tuesday. Ping pong. The Happy Way Tuesday. Ping pong. The Wicked Way Tuesday. On Black Tuesday. Ping pong. The Wicked Way Tuesday. She's really there. Ping pong. On Black Tuesday. proven that we can actually be civil to each other. In fact, just before taking the dais, Hillary accidentally bumped into me, and she very civilly said, pardon me. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and please share it. You can help us continue to fight in the war against disinformation by donating at paypal.me slash rightleftofcenter and at subscribestar.com backslash rightleftofcenter. I'm Right from Right Left of Center, and if you're watching, you're probably right too.